Well, good morning. Thank you, Tim and Jim. It's a great, great, it's great to be here. You know, um, it's not hard to get me to speak to anybody, especially if you want to talk about energy. And of course, you know, as the Attorney General, they're constantly asking me to come and speak to one group after another on, you know, on a various number of, of topics. But if you really want to get my attention, you say, hey, can you come talk to me about energy? Um, it is just something that, you know, I, I guess because I was born and raised in South Louisiana and recognized uh, the economic potential that the, in, that the energy industry gives to Americans and how it builds the middle class. You know, I'm going to just go off topic for just a second because Tim said something that reminded me. He was talking about the fact that today, over the next few days, y'all are going to talk about many topics that the media really doesn't want you to know or that you're not getting out there. And I will, I will, I want to encourage each and every one of you, if you don't have a Twitter account, you need to get one. You know, it used to be you could get a Facebook account and social media, um, you had the ability, conservatives did, had the ability to, to move your message or to talk to each other or to engage in political dialogue. And today, one of the things that attorney generals are facing uh, in looking at companies like Facebook and like Google is their suppression of conservative content. And so I would tell you that right now, probably the safest place to go is on Twitter. So if you don't have a Twitter account, but you have a Facebook account, I want to encourage you to, to get one. <clears throat> so anyhow, this is just a little housekeeping, just a little legal advice free. You, you know, we're not going to charge you for that one. But, you know, it, again, it's great to be here. I see some great faces in the audience, um, people from Louisiana that, that understand and appreciate conservatism, free markets, and the energy industry. You know, Tim gave me an opportunity last year to be with you all in Houston. What a great uh, event we had there. And we talked about some of the things that the president was planning on doing, right? We talked about uh, the initiatives that he was going to put in action. And I mean, wow, right? I, I don't know what else to say. There's only one word. It's like, wow. In 12 months, look what we have accomplished. I mean, the man is causing snowflakes to melt. I just want you to know that. <laughs> he has completely discredited the mainstream media. He has, you know, turned the media's, um, uh, I guess, hoax of the fact that fossil fuels are, ca are causing climate change up on its head. And at the same time, at the same time, he has grown the U.S. economy in 12 months faster than the previous president could in eight years. I mean, 4.1% GDP in one quarter? I mean, whoa. That's Trump economics, I call that, right? But I'm going to tell you something. He could not do that. There's no way that he or the American economy could be growing without our energy independence. You know, I can remember, and I think, Tim, you were still in Congress at the time when when uh, y'all debated the embargo or the moratorium on the exportation of oil, uh, you know, because after the oil embargo of the, of the 70s, the United States put in type, in, uh, instituted a policy that said that we would no longer export our oil, and they banned it. And then Congress was able to debate it, and they were able to pass it, and I remember talking to Steve Scalise at the time and telling him that I believed that that one small change was going to have one of the greatest impacts on the American economy. It was going to do more to balance our trade. It, was, it would do more to give America leverage on the world stage than anything else. And I tell you what, it, it has absolutely happened. It's absolutely shown and, and bore fruit. You know, what's interesting though is as we all know that American energy um, uh, is alive again and, and is basically, we're a leader in creating energy. There's a whole group of people out there that believe that we're destroying the earth and we're going to destroy mankind. I mean, it's just, it's amazing that just, you know, um, a couple of six, seven months ago, a city in, in, in California sued the four major oil and gas companies 
um, trying to hold them accountable for the worldwide effects of, um, of, of supposedly climate change. And I just want you to know, if, you, if you're still trying to knock off a couple of drinks that you had on Sunday in New Orleans, the, New Orleans is a prime example of climate change. If you stay here long enough, it's going to change. Not by mankind. It's going to rain. It's going to get real hot. It's going to get real cold. It's going to freeze. That's climate change, right? But it's not, it's not being done because we drill for oil and gas here in Louisiana. But this judge, it was interesting to watch. I don't know if any of y'all watched the trial uh, as it was laid out in California and, and how eloquently this judge basically cornered the environmentalists basically pinned them to their own game. And what a great victory it was when he dismissed that particular suit. You know, his conclusion, I'll read it, his conclusion said that the courts must respect and defer to other co-equal branches of government when the problem at hand clearly deserves a solution best addressed by those branches. I mean, because what they were trying to do was basically saying, that fossil fuels were, were the culprit for climate change and that these oil and gas companies had to be held responsible. And you know, it's amazing because just the other day I was reading where um, the new face of that, of, that, of the liberal movement is basically um, uh, Miss Alexandra Cortez. And just the other day, she noted that we should institute a carbon tax to the, tr to the tune of about $2.3 trillion that will finally wean the United States off of fossil fuels. She said that climate change is the single biggest national security threat for the United States and the single biggest threat to worldwide industrialization of civilization and the effects of warming can be hard to predict and self-reinforcing. She said we need to avoid a worldwide refugee crisis by waging war for climate justice through the mobilization of our population, our government. I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> What's concerning is that her message has resonated, and right now there are over 750 candidates and politicians who have signed a no fossil fuel pledge. Now let that sink in for a minute. Because it's gonna take people like you to go out there and ensure that everyone else has the facts necessary to combat this type of fiction. So let's talk about that fiction just a little while. Let's talk about ridding the United States of fossil fuels. You have that chart? All right. So if we wanted to power Houston, right? So let's say that the Houston metropolitan area um, uses about 2,700 megawatts of electricity a day. How many square miles of corn would we need to produce enough corn ethanol to produce the electricity to power Houston? It would take over 22,000 square miles of corn. Think about that footprint for it. I don't know who's gonna feed the beef, right? Who's gonna feed the cows and who's gonna, you know, but this is just using 22,000 square miles of corn to fuel enough electricity for one city. Well, I know she's going to say, well, we have wind. Well, how many square miles of wind would it take? It would take almost 900 square miles of wind. It would take almost 200 or 150 square miles of solar panels. Now, square miles. Now, when we, when we put all those solar panels out or we, or we erect all of these wind farms on all of these acres or square miles of land that takes that land out of commerce. It means you no longer can grow crops on it. 
You no longer can have <clears throat> um, refineries built. You no longer can have a city. Cities can populate. We no longer can have developments. And we're talking about simply one city in this country. And so what I would tell Ms. Cortez is what she should do is why don't she take 12 months of her life and try to live without fossil fuels? I want to know, when she's traveling to California, when she's traveling to California to fill up her purse, is she taking her bicycle? Is she walking like Kid Carson? No, she's getting on an airplane filled with jet fuel that people in this country have worked real hard to extract out the ground. Then they've worked harder to crack that oil, to turn into that jet fuel that gives her the luxury to go from New York to California to spew political rhetoric that destroys American jobs. We don't need that here. But what we do need is education. We need to make sure that people understand that that's the footprint. And that's what we're up against. I can tell you, you know, it, it, it just, it amazes me consistently at, at how some of this rhetoric takes foothold in this country. I remember one of the times, Tim, <clears throat> when you and I were, we were, we were um, it was an appropriations bill and the EPA uh, budget was up. And we put an amendment up on the floor that said no funds in this appropriation by the EPA can be used to purchase any service or product made with a fossil fuel. I mean, it didn't pass. It came close. I mean, how fun would that have been? How fun would it have been to take the people who, who have relentlessly destroyed an industry that has created so much wealth, not only in this country, but in this world? And let me ask you another question. How much good has oil and gas done around the world? How much clean water, how much sanitary conditions exist because you can bring electricity to places that never had it before. And then, of course, how much do we give up converting our energy to solar and wind? In other words, what does it take? Because for every solar panel, you know how many, you know how many rare earth metals we need? And you know who controls 99% of the rare earth metals in, this, in, the, in the world, the mines? Anybody know? There you go. See, I love y'all. I mean, it's just so easy to talk to y'all. Right, exactly. But you know, you never see that in the mainstream media. You never see the media talk about the amount of rare earth metals that it takes to create solar panels, that, that, that it, it takes to create wind. What's the carbon footprint of a, of, of a wind turbine? Think of the amount of steel and concrete needed to fashion one of those and compare it for the energy output that it takes. And then, oh, by the way, the other thing you'll never hear is the fact that for each one of those turbines, there needs to be a natural gas generator that is capable of producing the same amount of electricity that that wind turbine can produce when the wind doesn't blow. That way, Ms. Cortez can use her blow dryer when the wind doesn't blow. But that's the face of basically climate change hoax believers. People that believe that this industry goes out there and destroys the earth. But I'm going to tell you, the good news is we have Trump. <laughs> and when you think of the things that Donald Trump has done, when you think of the things that, that Scott Pruitt, who just left the EPA, 
the things that they were able to accomplish in 12 months. When you look at unemployment, when you look at unemployment amongst minority groups, in fact, right now, unemployment amongst Hispanics and blacks is at an all-time low. Because you know what the president and you believe that the greatest natural resource in America, you know what it is? It's the American people. It's the people that go out there every day and ply that trade. It's the people that go out there and create the services that we enjoy every day. And guess what? In order for FedEx to move their vehicles, in order for Detroit to build those cars, in order for Silicon Valley to operate their computers, there's one important component that's needed, and that's energy. And that's what you do. And that's what America does. And if you think about it, 20 years ago they said we didn't have any more oil, we didn't have any more gas, America was going to be dead last. Kind of sounds like 1% GDP growth is the new normal. That we will always be dependent on foreign oil. Well, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to tell you this. You know, Tim, you know what we need here in this country now? Now that we have realized that we are sitting on so much because the good Lord has blessed us, it's now time for us to make sure that our refining capacity in this country refines American oil. Okay? It's time for members of Congress and in this administration to do an inventory of the refining capacity in this country and recognize that, you know what, it's time for us to retool our refineries so that the oil and gas that Americans are extracting out of the ground can be utilized right here. And when we do that, we will be completely energy independent. And an energy independent America creates a safe America. It creates a prosperous America. It builds a middle class. It provides good jobs, good schools, it gives the ability for the government to give teachers a raise, to give our police and firefighters raises. And you know what else it does? It secures the safety and liberty of the entire world. And so it is just a great honor to come before people who understand that when America puts its energy first, America puts people first. America puts liberty first. And I, again, I plead with you all to make sure that people understand that unless you want to walk from New York to California, those wind turbines are just not going to get you there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>